He holds a master's and a PhD from the University of Chicago. We're very thrilled to have Seth here this afternoon to, or this evening to talk about uh, his book, Waging Insurgent Warfare, and also to just give us his perspective on contemporary events. And uh, I was lucky enough to sit down this afternoon with Seth and grill him on his views about a range of issues relating to terrorism and insurgency, which unfortunately is in the news a little all too often at the moment. We're running over, so I'll leave it at that and let Seth come up and begin his talk. Please welcome him. Thank you for those overly kind words. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, walking around uh, campus earlier today and seeing, seeing such a lovely campus did bring me back to my PhD days at the University of Chicago with a slight difference. For those of you who have been to University of Chicago, you may have seen the t-shirts that go around campus. On the front it says University of Chicago, and on the back it says where fun comes to die. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure that same motto is not actually used here on campus, such a beautiful um, place. Uh, and then one other comment, actually before I begin, I, I realize we're sort of at an after dinner uh, hour, so if you do feel the need to close your eyes and concentrate on my words, I'll take that as a sign actually of concentration uh, that, that, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do this together this evening. Um, before I begin, I just at least wanted to let you know, uh, in case you were not aware, that um, since uh, October of 2014, RAND, and I direct the International Security and Defense Policy Center there, uh, has an office here. Uh, we do a an increasing amount of work in Australia, have a base here in Canberra, um, and uh, look forward to uh, continuing to engage on multiple topics about 50% of RAND's work is on national security. The rest of it is on uh, a range of other issues, health, education, population, economic issues. Uh, so uh, we are proud to be a broader member of the community here and look to um, uh, continue to grow. So uh, we consider us a neighbor uh, in, the, uh, in the city. My talk today is going to focus more on, I'm going to use the term Islamic State, I realize we have lots of terms, uh, Daesh, ISIL, ISIS, I'm happy to go into that later. I'll use for the purposes of this talk, Islamic State. I'm going to focus mostly on that aspect. I, I can go into other aspects of the book. I look at 181 insurgencies in that book, and the book really focuses on uh, a whole range of issues of how, when insurgent groups have succeeded, why have they succeeded? What strategies have they used? Tactics, organizational structures, uh, information uh, operations, how they get insurgencies going from the beginning, and look at um, how they end. The book includes a range of methodologies from primary source uh, work to a large end regression analysis that looks at um, how insurgencies end and what factors contribute to it. I'm happy to go into a lot of that on the Q&A side, but I'm going to really focus on, uh, on issues related to the Islamic State and some of the implications, in part because it has such an important uh, policy impact today, including in Australia and what we see going on in other parts of the world, including recent attacks in France. Um, but I wanted to start out with a little bit of an anecdote, because I, gives, I think it gives us a sense of what we're dealing with. I'm going to start with uh, uh, a, a woman named Mina Justice. She was a mother, uh, still is a mother, down in uh, Florida, in Orlando, Florida. And she was asleep on the night of June 12th, 2016. She receives a text from her son. Her son's name is Eddie. Eddie was inside a nightclub uh, that many of you probably know now called Pulse uh, in, in, uh, in Orlando. Uh, he had taken refuge, uh, Eddie had taken refuge in the bathroom uh, as Omar Mateen, who had just pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, uh, starts his shooting spree. And his first text that he sends to his mother is, Mommy, I love you. It was 2.06 a.m. And then he texts, in the club, they shooting. Uh, she tries to call him. There's no answer. He had turned off the ringer on his cell phone for obvious reasons, for security reasons. And then she taps, she taps out a response to him. This is all by text. She says, are you okay? At 2.07, he responds a minute later that he's trapped in the bathroom. 
Uh, she asks which club. He responds, Pulse, downtown, call the police. Then at 2.08 uh, a.m., two minutes after the first text, he writes what is probably the most horrifying part of the whole texting, and he says to his mother, I'm going to die. He writes that he's in the bathroom, and then the next couple of texts, he's coming. I'm going to die. She asks her son if anyone was hurt and which bathroom he's in. He says lots. Yes. This is now 2.42, so about 40 minutes after the first text began, and then his last text is a 250. He says he's a terrorist. Then there's no more response. Eddie Justice, 30, was killed along with 48 others that night by Omar Mateen, who had pledged allegiance. Various forms of texts like that have occurred in Istanbul, in Paris, in Brussels, in Ottawa, in Garland, Texas, in Australia, in Jakarta. Uh, individuals that have either been inspired by or in a few cases uh, have been organized by uh, the Islamic State. The talk that I'm going to give tonight though uh, looks at trends and the question is in part um, uh, trying to set aside straight up policy issues. Analytically, what do we see going on with, uh, with the Islamic State? Um, the data sources that I'll use in making the argument are uh, look at writings and captured documents of the Islamic State, some field visits uh, that I've been into the Middle East, uh, Asia, including South Asia and Africa. So you'll see where I bring those in as uh, part of the talk. And then a look at the 181 insurgencies, at least that I've coded since 1945, to give a sense of what factors have contributed to the defeat of groups. Um, my outline will consist of three parts. I'm going to start off with uh, the current struggle and future trends, then I'll get into lessons from uh, past counterinsurgencies, and then I'll end with a note of caution. Let me start off with the, with the struggle and, and, and what we see now. Uh, for those of you who pay close attention to this, there's been considerable debate about the strengths and weaknesses of the Islamic State. Some argue that the Islamic State poses little or no threat. John Mueller, a good friend of mine, is a political scientist in the U.S., argues that its numbers are small. He argues that uh, the annual risk of dying in a terrorist attack uh, is, uh, or at, at one point recently, was one in 3.5 million, according to his calculations. Uh, much, uh, one is much more likely to die in traffic accidents, uh, routine homicides, natural disasters, industrial accidents, and even, surprisingly, drowning in a bathtub. Uh, is, one is more likely to die than a terrorist attack. Others have argued, David Kilcullen, that what we see with both the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda, that the West more broadly faces uh, in David's words, quote, a larger, more unified, capable, experienced, and savage enemy than we have ever seen. So how do we, how do we uh, uh, find an answer here? Which one of these or some combination is it with, uh, with the Islamic State? Uh, is it weaker? Is it stronger? Uh, what I'd like to look at is what does some of the data uh, that we have compiled um, suggest? But before I do it, I, I do want to talk for a moment briefly about ideology, because I do think it's worth looking at when you um, note the ideology of the group. Its goal has been very clearly since 2014, I would argue, expansion. Expansion not just in the Al-Sham area, but more broader into West, North, East Africa, into South Asia, and into the Pacific. And if you go back to the days of the taking of Mosul in 2014, we see uh, an Islamic State spokesman issuing a proclamation calling for, Baghdadi has done this as well, a pan-Islamic caliphate. And he says uh, at that point that the sun of jihad has risen, the glad tidings of goodness have shone forth, triumph looms on the horizon, the signs of victory have appeared, here the black flag of the Islamic State, the flag of monotheism, rises and flutters, it is a dream that lives in the depths of every believer. It is a hope that flutters in the heart 
of every Mujahid monotheist. It is the caliphate. Now the caliphate has returned. Um, we see the, this push for expansion, uh, and I think what we see, and, and why I would at least at various points call this an insurgent group, is territory becomes an important component uh, for the Islamic State. It's important to establish a state-like apparatus. It's important to collect money, finances. If you look at the way the Islamic State has collected money in areas they control, uh, territorial control is absolutely critical. Unlike groups like Al-Qaeda that have received funds from wealthy donors in the Gulf, the Islamic State has used its control of territory to establish the vast majority of its funds, whether it's oil refineries, whether it's smuggling operations, uh, whether it's uh, a range of other uh, ways, including kidnapping, that they, have, uh, that they have gotten money. So territory is important. But as we look across uh, several different indicators, um, how do we measure their strength and weakness, and what does that tell us about trends going forward? I'm going to look today at four different aspects uh, of trying to gauge strength or weakness of the Islamic State. And what you'll see is, is a mixed picture. But I do think it's important to lay this out. The first one is, uh, is expansion of branches. So I would say, as, as we look at the Islamic State today, we see four rough components of the group. First, we see the core area in Iraq and Syria. It's the central part. It's the Al-Sham. Um, it's where it cre has created its primary organizational structure to control territory, including its general governing committee and its state-like structures of diwans or ministries and wilayas or administrative districts that span both Iraq and Syria. Uh, its diwans issue directives and are organized into such areas as war fighting, agricultural, finance, justice, health, education, natural resources. If you haven't taken a look at them, we've seen over the past few years uh, much more primary source information on the organizational structure of the Islamic State that have come out and has been declassified as uh, former capture documents and put online through the counterterrorism centers uh, at West Point. It's Harmony database, uh, which provides now very large amounts of primary source uh, information on the Islamic State. So you can see spreadsheets of how they have organized themselves, how they kept track of money. So that Syria-Iraq uh, um, region has become important, certainly important as the core. Second, we see uh, a series of formal branches today, and I think what we're seeing it, when you look at this is, is an expansion uh, uh, over the past two years. In 2014, we saw formal branches, and when I use this term, I'm talking about um, these organizations that pledge Bayat, uh, allegiance to the Islamic State, to Baghdadi, and Baghdadi in return, and this becomes important, formally accepts their pledges. So in 2014, we saw Yemen, Libya, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, with the formal bayat and then the receipt. And then in 2015, Caucasus, uh, the AFPAC region, Nigeria with Boko Haram. Uh, so a, we're seeing an expansion of formal uh, branches. Uh, we also see a number of aspiring branches. Uh, and those are areas where some of these groups, seen it with Abu Sayyaf as well, pledged bayat to Baghdadi, but we don't have a formal response yet. And it looks like the Islamic State has, at least back in Syria and Iraq, uh, has made a range of decisions, in some cases, not to accept, at least for the moment, formal pledges. So we see elements in Somalia, the Philippines, Turkey, Bangladesh, Mali, Tunisia, and other areas of more informal branches. And I, but again, over the past two years, we've seen a, an expansion of both formal and informal branches. And then a fourth category of what I would call inspired individuals and incipient networks. These are networks that uh, uh, have no connection other than their involvement in social media. And in particular, we've looked at the um, uh, role of Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Telegram, Ask.fm, and Twitter as among the most important social media outlets for reaching to these inspired individuals and networks, uh, and we've seen growing numbers of attacks from these kinds of individuals, again, with no direct uh, connection at all. Um, 
we've seen a formal push to establish more of these from the Islamic State's Directorate of Remote Provinces, which indicates that they do have a formal way of doing this. But I would say, as, as, I, as I sort of try to summarize this first area, we have seen an expansion in their informal and formal uh, structures over the past two years since 2014. Which brings me to uh, a next category. Uh, so if we're seeing an expansion in those cell structures and groups, both uh, formal and informal, uh, what about control of territory? It's an important part of the Islamic State, as I noted earlier. Uh, where do we see freedom of movement, or where do we see control of territory or freedom of movement? Um, we've, we've looked at uh, various ways to code this. The term I'm going to use instead of control, which I think is probably an, a, a overreaching what they're doing in certain areas, is freedom of movement. I would define it as areas in which Islamic State fighters are permanently or mostly permanently garrisoned in villages or cities or at least nearby and operate freely during most or all times of day and night, building off of some of the work that Stathis Kalivas at Yale and several others have done on freedom of movement and, and control. To, to uh, assess that, we've done site visits to a number of these countries. Uh, we've looked at geographic terrain and used uh, GIS coding. Uh, we've also used the gridded population of the world GPW data set prepared by NASA's Socioeconomic Data and Application Center to look at population numbers. Uh, why do I say this? Because then the question is, starting in 2014, in each of these areas, what are we seeing in terms of freedom of movement uh, in, in uh, some of the key places? Uh, the areas that I'll talk a little bit about where they have controlled or tried to control territory include Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt, Libya, and Nigeria. So what do we see trends? Uh, the, the big takeaway as we look at it is a decline in territorial control or freedom of movement. So if we're seeing an increase in that first category of of branches and informal branches, uh, we're seeing a decrease in territorial control. They're losing their control of territory. Uh, by our account in Syria and Iraq, the core area, about a 36% decline in square kilometers between uh, 2014 and the spring of 2016, and a 49% decline in population in those areas. So 36% in territory, 49% in population. Those are pretty decent sized numbers. In Iraq, it's uh, pretty serious declines in Sinjar, Beji, Tikrit, Ramadi, uh, Fallujah more recently to a combination of local and allied forces, including airstrikes by um, Australian forces, as well as um, uh, local Sunni, Shia, Kurdish uh, militia groups on the ground. Syria, uh, we also see a similar decline, uh, particularly in northern and eastern Syrian provinces of Raqqa and Aleppo, uh, in large part due to airstrikes and Kurdish and Arab, including Assad, uh, ground force uh, efforts. In Afghanistan, we also see a pretty notable decrease in territorial control from 2015 numbers in particular, where they had some territory in Helmand uh, and Farah provinces, and they've largely lost it, largely due to Taliban efforts uh, against them. And we now see it shrunk into mostly a Nangahar province in the east. Nigeria, we've seen a, a decrease in, uh, in control or freedom of movement. Uh, this is Boko Haram, uh, thanks in part to uh, military operations by Nigerians, Chad, Cameroon, Niger, uh, and some um, locals. Uh, they've Boko Haram forces have retreated up into areas like, if you've been up in there in the uh, Mandera Mountains along the Nigerian uh, Cameroon border. And then finally, in Libya and Egypt, we've seen uh, uh, in Libya probably a slight decline in CERT, where they have lost some neighborhoods recently. Uh, Egypt, it's very small. Anybody who's been to the Sinai areas around where the Islamic State has uh, the checkpoints there are mostly Egyptian government run anyway, uh, but there is some um, what was Ansar Bait al-Makdis, now uh, the, uh, 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 the, the Sinai, uh, Islamic State Sinai, um, has, does have some freedom of movement in the area uh, around um, uh, Arish and then uh, a few other places near the Gaza Strip. Uh, 
but it's pretty small. But I think overall on the control or freedom of movement, we've seen a pretty notable decline of territory, again, in particular in the Iraq and Syria contexts. Um, third is pattern of violence, and this is going to be very interesting because we see a range of different things on patterns of violence, uh, and then I'll try to summarize it in a moment. Um, so Islamic State's primary means to expand its freedom of movement is the use of violence, and there are a couple of trends that I wanted to highlight. Um, one is uh, that we've seen different types of uh, uses of violence. In the early phases in 2014, it was largely conventional strategies and tactics. That shifted when airstrikes started occurring to more guerrilla tactics, and it's increasingly shifted to terrorist targeting, uh, that is, uh, targeting of civilians. Um, second, uh, the aggregate number of attacks by the Islamic State's core and its branches has increased somewhat markedly between 2014 and 2016. Which brings me to kind of the irony here is that uh, what we see is a decline in territorial control, but an increase in violence levels. There may be many reasons why this is occurring. Historically, insurgent groups have often ramped up terrorist attacks for several reasons, to attempt to coerce foreign forces by punishing civilians in their home countries, which is why we may see greater numbers of attacks in Europe, for example, uh, to bait foreign governments into overreacting, um, to, to uh, enact revenge uh, against governments that are um, adversaries, and in some cases just because it's easier to conduct some of these terrorist attacks against civilians than it is uh, conventional operations against better equipped and better armed forces. In terms of numbers, 2015 was a banner year for the Islamic State. The number of attacks exploded, and this is, this is sort of the third important issue on violence levels, is we've seen an, uh, 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 an expansion in the scope of violence. So not just numbers, but areas, with growing numbers uh, of attacks across Europe, into France, obviously Denmark, Turkey, Russia, uh, the U.S., Australia, and I'm including inspired attacks, so people who, who um, are doing this in the name of, uh, though e even if the organization wasn't done out of Iraq or Syria, including the Orlando attack that I mentioned earlier. So again, it's sort of an interesting pattern here, higher levels of violence at the same time that their territorial uh, control is declining. And then a fourth area is popular support. Um, what we're seeing in popular support Data is not great in some of these countries, but with the available evidence, at least that, uh, that I've looked at, uh, in general, by far the most important conclusion from available polling data is the overwhelmingly negative and increasingly negative views of the Islamic State in the Arab world, declining almost across the board in countries where polling is taking place. And it's being done for a number of reasons. Uh, so, again, we see some interesting combinations. We see declining control of territory would appear to be declining uh, popular support in areas they are operating in, but we see increasing numbers of attacks and increasing areas where they're conducting attacks. So what I would say overall to conclude is the group is changing before our eyes from a, an insurgent group that seizes and holds territory to a uh, increasingly active terrorist group that holds little ground uh, but is more active in targeting civilians. Um, and again, how this plays out in the future will be quite interesting, but I, that's kind of, it looks like, based on a range of those factors, what we see. Now, a couple of things that I wanted to note in looking at historical cases uh, about uh, the Islamic State is, is what factors have contributed to the defeat of insurgent groups and what does this mean? So based on that assessment of where we sit right now, uh, what are some of the factors? Uh, I'm going to highlight three here on factors that have contributed to the um, defeat of insurgent groups, uh, including ones like the Islamic State. First and I'll go to Mao uh, because I think he was right here, is that political uh, considerations overseas have generally driven successful um, counterinsurgency efforts. Uh, Clausewitz himself 
argues, I think quite rightly, that the political object will be the standard for determining the aim of the military force and also the amount of effort to be made, just as relevant for counterinsurgency warfare as it is for conventional warfare. Mao said, without question, the fountainhead of guerrilla warfare is in the masses of the people. Uh, the focus, I think then, and a major focus moving forward, should then be addressing the political and other grievances uh, that have allowed the Islamic State to secure support in areas that we are talking about. And this is one of the most significant concerns I think we have, is that the military efforts to degrade their territorial control in virtually all the areas I spoke about are moving much faster than political efforts to address grievances. Uh, Iraq is one of the many cases in point where we have declining territorial control, but virtually all of the reasons that Sunnis either tacitly or strongly supported either the Islamic State, JRTN, or any of the groups operating in Anbar, those grievances have not been adequately addressed. There are still deep-seated concerns about a government that they believe is too closely tied to Iran, that is too closely tied and too closely supportive of Shia, uh, and a whole range of other grievances that those of you who are Iraq experts, I'm sure, can expound on. Um, we can talk about similar issues in Syria and in Libya and in other areas. The point being that until political considerations are dealt with more effectively, uh, it is hard to see success against this group staying entrenched. A second issue is ideology. In virtually all cases where we have seen insurgent groups defeated on the battlefield, um, the ideology has been significantly countered, successfully countered to the degree where they just don't have people effectively supporting them. And one of the statistically significant findings from at least the, the uh, quantitative data we looked at is one variable that does appear to be um, correlated with insurgent defeat is the use of what I would call a punishment strategy and punishment tactics. Um, this is, we've seen groups in the past, GIA in Algeria, target large numbers of civilians. Uh, the Islamic State is one of the most violent organizations that has targeted civilians that we have seen. Uh, this is likely, based on past cases, is likely a very serious problem uh, for the Islamic State in the future. Uh, it has not been willing to change this, its use of these kinds of uh, strategies and tactics, punishment. And I think over the long run, we have seen uh, that an effective campaign, as we saw with Algeria, to highlight these issues can severely undermine popular support for groups that use this. But I think I would just, I'm going to highlight a few things that, that I think have not been done particularly well uh, across many of our governments, uh, including here in Australia. Um, and I think we have collectively done a poor job of highlighting injustices done by this organization, done by the Islamic State, by primary source individuals. I am not convinced, and in, look, in our analysis on, on the debates that happen on Twitter and other social media forums, that governments doing this has much legitimacy at all. But what we do see, uh, we, we do see in past cases is some of the most effective um, counter ideological efforts come from defectors uh, that were members of the organization or those who had to live under uh, these type of organizations. So populations that lived in villages, in this case, that were under the control of the Islamic State that can talk about what, what life was like publicly, on television, in newspapers. And we all collectively live in a society that how do we treat in individuals that defect from these organizations? We put them in jail. Uh, we may recruit a small number of them, but we generally put them in jail. Uh, I, I, the, I, I would say we have, we have got to think of ways of uh, allowing people to speak about their time under Islamic State control, uh, or in some cases, defectors um, to talk about what uh, life was like as they were members of the organization. Um, there are in interesting examples from people that have defected from gangs and the willingness to do that, but I, I, I don't think we have effectively uh, put together a campaign that deals with that.
And then finally, on military efforts, and I think we have learned lessons collectively in dealing with groups like this. You don't do it with large numbers of conventional forces uh, in general. Uh, if you're going to assist, you're going to assist legitimate local partners, and you generally do it with small numbers, mostly special operations type forces and intelligence units, and you're basically building uh, capacity at a local level uh, on the military side. Um, we've had challenges, but I wanted to point to one, uh, one challenge in Somalia, a place where I've been recently, uh, just to note some interesting, uh, interesting strategies used with governments, uh, in, in this case the Somali government, that, um, that is very limited in its ability to function uh, anywhere, even in Mogadishu. Uh, and on the military side, I mean, the focus of many Western governments was to build a, a regional capacity. It's what it's the African Union mission in Somalia, Amazon, that has been at the focal point of taking back territory from Al Shabaab. So even in cases where the government is relatively weak, there have been interesting solutions, including from regional organizations like the African Union to try to take back on the military side territory from these uh, organizations. But again, you don't deal with the ideology and the political aspects of it. Uh, you know, these are only short-term solutions. And I think we may be seeing that with the return uh, uh, in territorial control from Al-Shabaab. Let me just conclude with, uh, with two words of caution, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, first, uh, it, it is without a doubt likely to be a long war. If you look at the number of insurgencies in the Cold War that were Marxist-Leninist uh, supported, Soviet-based, uh, between 1946 and about 1988, between 40 and 60 percent of all insurgencies were communist, Marxist-Leninist, uh, uh, by, by, uh, at least by my data. After the end of the Cold War, they've gone down to very small numbers. Uh, and we've seen, at the same time, a major increase in uh, extremist Islamic uh, insurgencies. Uh, by 2016, 50% of insurgencies globally uh, have groups that uh, espouse an ex extremist, extremist Islamic uh, component to it. So we have, we have, we have uh, I don't know if we've peaked, but we're in the middle of that era. And I think, based on those trends, I think we're likely to see this is it. We've this has lasted for at least 20 years so far, depending on when you count the beginning. I think we're likely to see uh, this to last for at least another decade or two, uh, if not potentially longer. And then again, second uh, on, on words of caution, and I mentioned this earlier. Um, I would suspect we've seen this with other groups that as the Islamic State continues to lose territory, it will most likely ramp up its levels of violence. Um, I noted some reasons why groups have done this in the past, um, so I expect to see that in the future. And uh, we see innovative styles of attacks in the West now. Uh, we see the Nice attacks. So you don't need to pick up a gun, you can drive a truck through a parade area. We've seen improvised explosive devices using ingredients that one can buy from uh, various stores, uh, even in small quantities, and putting them together. I think that's the area and the, the, uh, the, the era we're now living in, sadly. Uh, so it's likely to get more violent before it calms down. But I think, just to end on a positive note, if we can continue to shrink the territory uh, control of this organization, figure out better ways, I've mentioned a few on the ideological front, and focus a lot of our efforts on helping to deal with some of the political and e economic grievances that are driving it, that we will, to steal a phrase from US President Ronald Reagan, that we'll reduce this organization, its ideology, and others like it to the dustbin of history. So. I don't know how long that will take, but that is at least my aim. So I think along those notes, I will stop and we will hand this over. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if you could please comment on the, the initial funding. We saw phenomenal access to finances and resources when ISIS first appeared on the global radar. Could you comment on how they obtained those yeah. resources? Good question. Uh, and again, with groups like Al-Qaeda, we saw a fair amount of money that had come in various uh, years from uh, 
uh, wealthy Gulf donors, not necessarily state, but wealthy Gulf donors. Uh, with the Islamic State or Daesh, uh, the funding is a couple, we, we've seen is a, a couple of different types of funding. Um, one is uh, its involvement in smuggling operations. Uh, so stolen cars, for example, uh, has been an important source of uh, funding. Uh, its seizure of uh, oil and uh, oil fields for some period of time was an important source of revenue. So the Beijing oil refinery, for example, and then and then taxes that have gone along with the selling of it, of of oil, uh, the seizure of uh, banks. Uh, as uh, as the Islamic State took areas, including in Mosul, in uh, in Fallujah, uh, is literally walking into banks and taking out large amounts of money. Uh, we've seen extortion, uh, so that is um, in in return for not blowing up, uh, not blowing up telecommunications infrastructure. That it. Will you have to pay a ta you have to pay a tax on that? We've seen groups like the Taliban in Afghanistan, including in Ruzgan, where uh, Australia operated, do similar things. Uh, we call that extortion. So uh, it's basically ransom for um, not blowing up infrastructure uh, by companies, and then some kidnapping, uh, ki some kidnapping money as well. The challenge for them, though, is as the territory has shrunk, their ability to tax has gone down seize money from uh, uh, and make money off of oil has gone down somewhat. So uh, the shrinking of territorial control has meant, and, and actually the targeting uh, of uh, bulk cash uh, that the Islamic State has controlled, uh, the, the targeting of bulk cash, I literally in some cases blowing up um, uh, buildings that have held large amounts of bulk cash uh, they're trying to disperse that now. That's been looks like it's been somewhat effective in undermining their their amount of money. But they've got a lot of money. I mean, are, there aren't many groups I would say, as I look at insurgent terrorist groups that have had as much money. Hezbollah is one of the best examples I think of a group that has got a business model for how to make money, including with the drug business. Uh, the Islamic State has done pretty well in financing itself locally, though. So um, that's. That's, that's at least my take on how uh, we've done a lot of looking at the financing of the Islamic State. That's my take on how it's done it. You said uh, punitive strategies were highly correlated with uh, ending insurgencies. Would you expand on what you coded yeah, as punishment punitive strategies. strategies? Punishment strategies? Yeah, so when a group uses a punishment strategy, and by punishment, so I, I, I would argue that there are a couple of different types of strategies groups have used. Uh, conventional strategies, that is, defeating their adversary, the government, on a battlefield. Uh, guerrilla strategy, which is not defeating on the battlefield, but essentially targeting its will um, by ambushes and raids. And then punishment is, is it's not, you're not trying to defeat them on the battlefield or targeting their government forces through raids, but it's targeting the civilian population. We've seen conventional forces do this. We saw this in World War II in the targeting of German cities um, in Japan, uh, including the firebombing in Tokyo. So this is the insurgent use of a punishment strategy. What appears to be the case is, um, and this is the this is a this is a statistical correlation, uh, is that when groups have used punishment strategies, their uh, odds of winning are are. Uh, negative, they generally lose. So what, what that tells me is, and there may be many reasons for it, again, correlation, not a causation, but as I've looked at some of these cases, what it looks like it's probably the case is when groups use a punishment strategy and target civilians, it undermines the very important local support that Mao talks about. So people don't like them. When you target large numbers of civilians, you're not building a uh, po positive morale, and you need to groups. This is why when you look at Mao, Mao talked, you know, he had his uh, seven or so steps. When you, uh, you know, when you go into somebody's house, you clean up after yourself. I mean, this is, the Islamic State has done, like the GIA in Algeria has done exactly the opposite. So that appears to be, 
the, why those quantitative findings mean that punishment strategy generally leads to defeat in the end. That's how I argue. Um, we've seen a very large effort in uh, Saudi Arabia and Singapore at trying to de-radicalize members from IS and kind of bring them back from the threshold. How would you rate the kind of uh, US efforts in, in the same kind of fields? Um, okay. Uh, the, the, the reason that's a hard question to answer is um, the data for answering that question is actually not very good. So uh, one of the challenges is, I think, as in Australia, there's been a, an increase, increasing amount of funding that's gone into CVE programs. Uh, but I mean, I think this is where the academic community has a lot of value and the analytical community has a lot of value to add. Uh, what is the framework we're using to measure the effectiveness of these kinds of programs? Um, I don't think we're collectively there yet. So we are spending money and we have programs along these lines. Uh, I don't think we have a good framework for measuring the effectiveness of the money we're spending on CVE programs. So the, the U.S. is doing a range of things uh, as part of its CVE efforts. Uh, how effective are they? It's, it's really, I would say it's hard to gauge. The data is really unclear right now. One of the things that is a bit concerning is, um, according to the uh, Director of National Intelligence, Clapper, um, uh, his testimony earlier this year in 2016, um, he noted that uh, the FBI arrested uh, 10 individuals that were either inspired or directly linked to the Islamic State for plotting attacks in 2014. That number jumped to 60 in 2015. Uh, we don't have a count yet for 2016, but it looks like it's going to be 80, 90. So, um, at the very least, what we're seeing is a, an increase in the number of plots linked directly or inspired by the Islamic State. Does that tell us that the programs are, are ineffective? I, I don't know, but it's not a good sign. So, um, I mean, I, I, I do think in general that, uh, that we don't see most of the communities in the limited polling that's been done in the U.S., most of the communities appear pretty happy uh, in general, integrated. They vote, uh, including some of the communities in Dearborn, Michigan, where there's been concern about uh, radicalization, in, and as well as in some cities like New York. Most of the populations are, I think, much more integrated than what we see in areas of uh, Europe, for example. So I, I think... I, I, you know, it's not, the, the data is not real clear on giving you a good answer. Uh, so there does appear to be some contentment with life in the U.S., but we do see growing numbers of plots. Uh, so I, I don't entirely know how to square the circle. What, what I'd like to see is just better uh, analytical work that looks at how effective these programs are um, to, to give us a better, a, a better sense. Uh, thanks. Can I ask you to look into the crystal ball a little bit? With the continuing shrinkage of territory and population under Islamic State's control, is the caliphate going to collapse completely, do you think? And if so, what do you think happens to the foreign fighters who've been there supporting it? Does that atomize the risk around the world as they all return home and wreak destruction in their home countries? And if I can push my luck with just one last one, please. Um, does Islamic State itself, can it survive without an Islamic State? Uh, and if not, what then happens to the group, its ideology and its, foreign, and its followers, please? Okay, a uh, couple of issues there. Um, I'm not convinced, so uh, I'm, I'm not, on your, your first question about the caliphate, uh, I'm not convinced we're close to a defeat of the caliphate right now. Uh, I think we have enough challenges in places like Libya, uh, where we are far from a political agreement, and, uh, and in, in that case then we will have opportunities for the group to at least hold some territory in some areas. Uh, your foreign fighter question, um, can you remind me, so the question was uh, if we were to see a a significant, continue to see a significant decline in territorial control. What would we do? What we see with forward fighters? 
I mean, one of the interesting things, actually, and I, I think um, many of us that have been asked to weigh in to the current Obama administration on Afghanistan, for example, uh, and U.S. numbers there, one of the issues that we have noted is uh, uh, that a worsening situation in some countries, Afghanistan would be one, Libya might be another, um, could act as uh, new battlefields in the future. So my point is uh, that we've already seen a decline quantitatively in foreign fighter flows to Iraq and Syria. Uh, I think that has been that has now been pretty well established in 20 late 2015 and early 2016 we saw that peak uh, probably 2015 we saw it peak and we're seeing a decline in number of foreign fighters to those areas but I, I would say if we get new opportunities for uh, battlefields whether it's Afghanistan whether it's Libya uh, Somalia if we see a resurgence of Al Shabaab uh, Philippines I mean, for a while it looked like uh, uh, Abu Sayyaf and a range of groups had been largely defeated a couple of years ago, but I think there are now concerns in Indonesia and Malaysia and Philippines itself. So I do think uh, there are opportunities for foreign fighters to go if they, if they start to lose Iraq and, and Syria. And I think the, the challenge may be we may get multiple battlefields and multiple opportunities for these groups to go. Um, can the Islamic State survive? Your last question, uh, I, I would say this, if the political and economic and social issues that are driving conflicts in many of the countries we're seeing are not addressed, uh, I think what we'll end up with is a 2.0 or a 3.0. I, I just find it hard to believe that as if we, if, if we can shrink the territory in Iraq and Syria, but we don't effectively address either, either the grievances of the Sunnis in Anbar or a number of uh, folks in Syria that are not happy with, uh, with the Assad government, we'll have plenty of opportunities for militancy in those regions. So um, I think in that sense that, that the Islamic State or some successor organization could certainly survive. And I think that's the case, I would argue, in, in Libya, potentially in East Africa, uh, in various places, in Yemen, certainly. Uh, so I, I don't see this one ending, uh, ending soon. Again, whether you have the overarching Islamic State that we have, or it fractures into a range of decentralized organizations, that's a hard one to... Uh, uh, to know, you know, people have Bruce Hoffman uh, in Foreign Affairs has argued, looked at the possibility of an Islamic State Al Qaeda merger at some point, and what it might take for that to happen. You probably have Baghdadi die. I mean, you'd, you'd have to have change in successors, but there may be some interesting possibilities in the in the in the future. Hi, I'm, I'm interested in the analysis of writers like Sarah Chayers, who would argue that. Uh, the greatest asset these insurgencies have is the dysfunction of the the governments mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, in Iraq, which are, you know have a record of being tribally partisan, corrupt, and occasionally predatory, uh, which is at the heart of all the grievances mm -hmm. that you mention. Um, what, if any, levers does the international community have to address these problems? That's a good question. Sarah's a good friend. Uh, I, I, that's a hard question to, to answer. There have been a lot of things that have been tried. Um, I think some of the more successful, I mean, I'm not an economist or an or a expert on development, but I would know in, in working this issue in Afghanistan, including with Sarah, the uh, you know, World Bank has tried a number of different levers in providing assistance based on certain conditions. Um, there was a lot of pressure to clean up banking system in Kabul after the Kabul bank crisis. Uh, so, you know, part of the question is if your IMF or World Bank or your government's bilaterally funding uh, some of these kinds of governments doing it on a conditionality basis. So uh, various amounts of funding are provided based on de demonstrated changes in improving the various issues you have identified. I actually think it's, it's you know, my, my own sense, e even in Afghanistan, some of this has contributed to a slightly less corrupt government in Kabul. I mean, the, the, uh, 
it's not a big change. It's still one of the most corrupt governments in the world, um, at least by transparency and, and World Bank data. Um, but I think there, there may be efforts uh, in providing uh, financial assistance that you can do. Again, I'm not an expert in this area, so uh, there, there may be banking experts here that have um, specific ideas along those lines. Um, you know, the, 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 there is one other issue that, uh, that, has, that has been tried. I mean, there are a range of other issues that have been tried as well. Um, uh, and, and I know it's one that we looked at in Afghanistan, among others, is then minimizing the amount of money you're putting through at the national government level and pushing it into local levels. So uh, in about 2009, a lot of the funding from various governments, uh, the percentage that went in through the Afghan government changed and a lot more went into vi villages, uh, district level government officials, and even provincial ones. So it, it escaped the uh, corruption at the national level. And it just changing percentages. So I think there have been, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are efforts worth taking a look at. But I think this, the broader issue is this does go to the point, and I would agree, that a lot of these issues drive insurgencies. And if you don't deal with them effectively, um, then, uh, then you're not going to deal with the problem in the long run. Uh, our militaries generally work much faster than our political bodies do. Richard, you said that uh, their territory is decreasing, their violence is increasing, uh, their funding may be decreasing. Is there any correlational data to suggest that they're then transferring more effort to cyberspace, to remote influence, to um, spreading their message more electronically than physically? So as one set of um, conflict tools decreases, they're increasing the other cyberspace tools of conflict? I don't know that, that uh, I, I don't see data that indicates a, an increasing use of cyber, for example, or social media, but I will note that they, they use that quite extensively. One, one of the things, if you look at um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula for years uh, had, in the establishment of a magazine they called Inspire, had tried to inspire individuals to conduct attacks uh, and did not have much success. Uh, after bin Laden's death, Ayman al-Zawahiri is not a very charismatic leader. Uh, they did not inspire many people to do it. Um, but the Islamic State has been different. Uh, their use of social media has been much more savvy. I don't know that they've increased it. I don't know how to gauge that. But what I will say is what we've looked at is um, they are very extensively, uh, as I noted earlier, very, very extensive in their use of multiple social media forums. So we see that in, again, ask.fm. We see it in Twitter. We see it in MySpace. We see it in a range of different activities. So I think in that sense, what we do see is very active use of social media uh, for um, recruitment, financing, um, uh, and general support. Uh, and they have definitely been more successful than uh, their Al-Qaeda brethren in inspiring people to do what we've seen in, in France, in Belgium, and other locations. So they are, something about what they're doing in this platform is, is inspiring people to act in ways that uh, we have not seen Al-Qaeda, though they have tried to as well. I don't think it's as much of an increase, and I'm not sure we'll see it necessarily see an increase, but we will see a continuing focus on those kinds of forums. Um, they're going to have a hard time getting cells into the West, uh, but they can inspire people. Thank you very much. Um, in the last couple of years, um, we've seen the coalition that consists of over 60 nations um, around the world conducting severe airstrikes against Daesh or ISIL. Um, however, these airstrikes were unsuccessful to a certain extent. Now, looking at these 60 nations fighting a bunch of idiots on the ground and unable to defeat them, what are the alternative options that we can do in order to achieve um, a resolution where we can actually defeat this terrorist organization? Thank you. 
Uh, good question. I wish there was an easy answer to that. I mean, I, I would say to push back a little bit um, that I think I think uh, the when you look at the reasons for the um, decline in territorial control, it's mostly been local forces that have done it, not the airstrikes. The airstrikes have the, the issue is Daesh has done increasingly a better job of hiding from airstrikes, but where it's lost territory, it's been um, Kurdish forces in Iraq and Syria, or local, the popular mobilization forces, or um, in some cases, Sunnis in Anbar uh, pushing back against Daesh. So I, I do think, you know, this group wants to hold territory. And I think the issue is uh, uh, that using local legitimate forces on the ground is an important component of taking territory away from them. Uh, again, I would emphasize, as we've talked about earlier, that more focus and effort needs to be spent on addressing the challenges that we face on the political front, too. So ideally, for them to lose permanently that territory, they are they lose that territory on the ground to some degree, but the issues that are causing them to rise up are better addressed. Some of that's going to have to be in Damascus. Some of that's going to have to be in Baghdad. I, I, it's hard for me to gauge how much we collectively are doing, but it's clearly not working in getting Baghdad to change its policies and how it deals with Sunni communities in provinces like Anbar. There's still a great degree of animosity. My concern is, and until those issues are dealt with, uh, there are still ripe opportunities for territory to come back. One interesting example along these lines is Somalia, where Amazon forces, Ethiopians, Kenyans, Ugandans, have taken back territory from al-Shabaab. Uh, there have been virtually no efforts to deal with the social and economic grievances down in southern Somalia. And now we see al-Shabaab going from controlling 55% in 2010 to about 5% last year, probably up to 8 or 9% this year, gives you a sense that we move in waves if we don't address these problems. So again, I'm going to come back to this issue, and then and you could look at Libya and say the same thing uh, about the political negotiations. So again, my point would be to identify the grievances in these countries that are causing people to support uh, even if they're low numbers, or, or at least angry, and deal with them just as we're dealing on the military side. But I, I think they are losing ground. I just worry they're going to regain it, or someone will regain it at some point if we don't address these issues. One more. We have time after this. We have time for one more. Okay, one more question after this. Thanks. This better be better be good. <laughs> um, just quickly, I wonder if you could um, just talk a little bit more about that polling you mentioned. Um, levels of support. I guess it comes out of the um, sort of political point you're making, but um, yeah, in the countries where the branches are and the like. Uh, so what, what's the question is? is uh, so just if you could talk a bit more about that polling, you sort of um, mentioned it, but then you said the data wasn't that great, but um, you didn't sort of elaborate a lot more. Maybe who's conducting the polling? What's it sort of sure. what questions so, they're asking? So we've looked at uh, data from, for example, um, a Pew Research uh, in a range of various questions that have been asked over time about support for the Islamic State. And, and, and here's the issue. Uh, is Islamic State support in a number of countries does appear to be declining where we have data. The, the caveat is uh, we don't have in a number of the countries I'm talking about. In key parts of Anbar, I haven't seen good recent polling data. So there are areas where we don't have it. But what we have is the, it looks like declining support for the Islamic State or Daesh in a number of areas but we still have angry people on the ground. So I, again, I would, I would also be a little careful in, in taking too much from the polling data because on the one hand, declining support for a group where people believe that it has not governed effectively in areas that it has controlled and it uses too much violence and targets too many civilians. But at the same point, we, do, we, we still do see large amounts of unhappiness with local governments and that continues to be the case. So it may be interesting to see uh, 
whether we see support for Daesh at some point go back up if some of these issues aren't addressed. But the data I'm talking about is, is, uh, is uh, so according to the Pew data I'm talking about, this is an April 2016 poll, uh, support for Daesh is uh, declining with nearly four in five, that is 78% rejecting the group outright, even if it were to change its tactics. Just 13% of young Arabs in a couple of these countries looked at um, say they could see themselves supporting Daesh uh, compared to 19% last year. So that's with a decline, 19 uh, to 13. Uh, according to Pew data, uh, which looked at 11 countries um, with significant Muslim populations, we saw declines uh, virtually all of them. Lebanon, 99% of respondents expressed a very unfavorable opinion of the group. Um, and that included across the board Sunni Muslims in Lebanon, Shia, uh, and obviously and, and Lebanese Christians as well. Jordan, 94% were strongly opposed to the Islamic State, and that those numbers were um, were uh, were stronger this past time that they conducted the poll from the time before. So you know most of these trends look like uh, decreasing support. Um, again, with caveats that uh, I, I have not seen good. Maybe you have polling data in Syria. Uh, there's been some, I don't know how reliable it's been, so there are some gaps in, in polling data. Hi, sorry, and uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just, you mentioned an interesting point about um, the Kurdish forces being far more successful in gaining territory. Um, so I was just curious if you- in, in generally, those are in, in Kurdish areas, though. All right. Um, I was just curious if you could elaborate on um, how do you see the, the question of Kurdish independence evolving um, as the situation play out in the near future? Kurdish independence. I am not an expert on Kurdish independence. Uh, what I will say, though, is it's been interesting to watch the effectiveness of Kurdish forces both in Syria and Iraq, uh, and a number of governments, including the US, willing to provide assistance to effective Kurdish forces on the ground. I suspect that probably adds to a desire at some point for uh, greater independence, certainly if not autonomy. But the more effective they are as a military force in taking back territory, I suspect the more some Kurds are going to want independence. So I mean, I, I'm not the best person to be talking about Kurdish issues. There are far more experts than I am. But I just seeing the effectiveness of some of their forces on the ground makes me believe that, um, and the fragmentation of the region makes me su suspect that sooner rather than later we'll be, we'll be having to deal seriously with this question of Kurdish independence. Um, I mean, it's complicated, but good question. Maybe that's the next talk. <laughs> Seth, we'd like to thank you very, very, very much uh, for that talk. It was very informative. And uh, for those of you who are interested, a reminder, Seth books out in November. I think it is, through Oxford University Press, where you can get hold of some of that data. So this is just a small gift for us to say thank you very much uh, for coming. Tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who are interested, if you'd like to have a talk to Seth, we've now got uh, some drinks outside in the foyer. And a friendly reminder, too, that on the 8th of August, we have Richard Fontaine coming from a centre from a new American security to discuss foreign policy post Obama, whichever way the election goes. And you escaped. There were no, no one questions. asked me a Trump question, by the way. <laughs> I, was ready, I was ready for a Trump question. Please thank Seth. Okay.